That's worth praising. Good deal. Good deal. Go ahead and have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, grab your Bibles. Grab your pens. Grab the notes that were passed you as you came in through the doors this morning. I'm going to be reading this morning from the book of Philippians. So if you will, open your Bibles up to Philippians chapter 4. Hurry up. I don't got all day. Now, really, I do hope to maybe get you out a little bit quicker here today. So uh, uh, if you listen fast, I'll talk fast. We'll get through it. Have a good time in the process, all right? We're in a series called Here's Hope today. Here's hope for your mind. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, as we worship you and praise you and come with thanksgiving today, I pray that, that that will saturate our minds, how great you are that we will focus on your incredible works, what you have done in our lives. And Father, by faith, look forward to what we know you will accomplish in us. Father, have your way. Let the praise, let the thanks that we have, the worship of you, change us, transform us. Help us today to focus on what is good and true and right. And in that, have victory the victory that can only come through you, the victory in our minds. I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Raise your hand. Let me tell you why I'm asking you to raise your hand first, okay? Uh, I mean, go ahead if you want to. Uh, Raise your hand if you have problems. All right, let me hold them. Keep them up. Keep them up. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Keep them up. Keep them up. All right. Now, here's the deal. If the person next to you didn't raise their hand, look at them and say, you're a liar. All right. You are a liar. Good, good, good. Uh, Good. Because, uh, well, the truth is we all have problems, right? We all have problems. And, And just maybe, just maybe that you are one of the rare few who today could not raise your hand truthfully and say, man, I've got no problems whatsoever in my life, then I just want you to know, get ready because they're coming tomorrow. (laughs) They are coming, man. They are coming. And, And here's the deal. With our problems, so often we do a little bit of math in our heads. And we go, problem number one plus problem number two plus problem number three equals no joy. No joy. I mean, isn't that the way it all adds up in my life, that if I've got this problem and this problem and this problem, then there's, how in the world could I have joy? Doesn't joy equal zero problems? No. No, you see, we're adding it all up wrong. We're adding it all up wrong. There's, there, there's a different calculation that we find here in God's Word. There's a different way of adding it up where, where we, can, we can add up problem after problem after problem after problem after problem after problem, and it's still equal joy. Amen. Joy? Are you kidding me? Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. If you add problem to problem to problem, thinking that it equals no joy, then I want you to understand something. Your problem is not your problem. Your problems are not your problem. Now, you see, there's a bigger problem. There's a greater problem, and the problem is in your mind. You see, there's a battle that is raging. There's a battle that's going on day in and day out, and the battle is for your mind. The battle is for your mind. But the good news is that here in God's Word, we find out how that we can have joy in the middle of our problems. You see, God's Word will never, ever say that the Christian will have no problems, at least not in this world, in this life. No, instead, it's not a changing of our circumstances, a getting rid of our problems that produces joy. There's something else. That produces joy in our life. And that's what we find right here in God's Word in the book of Philippians. 
Paul writes, and it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture in all the Bible. But you have to understand that he's, he, in the book of Philippians, he's actually writing this letter to the Philippians, and he's writing it to them from prison, from jail. Problem number one. Not only, though, is he writing from prison, he's writing knowing that it's very, very possible that he is about to be executed. Problem number two. But nevertheless, problem one plus problem number two in Paul's life doesn't add up to no joy. Instead, it adds up to this overwhelming, amazing joy that's going on. And if that's the case, I'm going, Paul, tell me, share with me, what in the world is going on? How can I have that? Because I know, you know, we'll always have problems on this world. But the possibility to have joy in the middle of our problems, well, that really is otherworldly. That's something else. That's... That's amazing, but that's what's given to us right here in Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin to read what he writes, but as we do this, I'm going to have you circle one word in particular as we go through, and then we'll focus on that a little bit later on. Philippians chapter 4, let's begin, starting in verse 4. Paul says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. As if once wasn't enough, he wants to make it really, really clear. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now, that's the word I want you to circle, okay? Circle that word. We're going to circle around back to it a little bit later. And then he says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, he says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It's his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing he says. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, here's what we're going to do real quick this morning. As we look at this scripture, we're going to find that not only does Paul address the enemies of our mind, the common enemies of our mind, what I call the three big ones, he addresses that, we see that, but then it's not just, it's not just saying don't let this enemy win in your life. He shows us how to do it. He shows us what to put in place where this once was. And so that's what we're going to look at here this morning. I hope you're with me on this. But we begin, first of all, with the thoughts that will steal away our joy and peace. These are the big enemies of our minds. Any, anything else that occupies our minds that's negative really kind of relates to one of these big three, okay? So let's begin with the first one. Number one is simply this, guilt for my past, guilt from my past. Real quick, raise your hand if there's anything in your past that you are not very proud of. Yeah, okay. That's most of us. That's most of us. It's pretty good. Well, what happens as a result? Well, so often that guilt from our past, we end up carrying it around for the rest of our life, don't we? We look back and we say, well, I shouldn't have done that, and I hate that I did that, and I wish I could go back and fix all that. I wish I could do it over. I wish I could change all these things from my past. But the truth is we can't. So what are we, what are we uh, going to do then? Well, maybe I just got to carry it around. Maybe this is my burden to bear. Maybe this is what I got to wear the rest of my life. But there is another option. There is another option. We find it here in God's Word. We find it in Scripture. Psalms 51, verse 12. Look what David says, King David. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, that's important, and if you study the, the Bible, if you study Scripture, if you studied Psalms at all, you would probably realize and know that uh, King David, at one point in his life that this, this uh, psalm is referring to, did something horrible. He did something awful, really terrible, certainly something not, not something a good king would do. What did he do? Well, he had an adulterous relationship with another man's wife. Not only was it just any other man, but this other man's wife happened to be the captain of his own army. Well, David didn't feel too guilty about it, and how do we know that? Because, well, the prophet comes to him, and the prophet has to tell David, 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 
you did this and it's a terrible thing. Don't you even see this? And it's only at that point that David suddenly goes, oh, no, you're right. How terrible, how wrong of me to do that. Well, you see, David did this and he even took it a step further in order to hide the pregnancy. Well, he had a, had a hit almost pulled out on the captain of, of his guard. And that's when the prophet comes. That's when it's revealed. And that, at that time, was when David repents. That, at that time, is when David realizes. And he has this some tremendous amount of guilt in his life. And then we see David going to the Lord, and it's here. It's here that he prays this prayer. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. The joy? Ah, oh, what's going on? What's happening? There's a song. You know the song. You've sang the song. You've known the song probably since you were little. It's a very popular song. We sing it all the time. And it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a... Y'all are quick on the wretch right there. <laughs> That's right. Saved a wretch. And what, a, what, a, what an appropriate word, right? Because the truth is we can all look at our life and go, what a wretch. What a wretch. I know me better than anybody else knows me, and I can look at my life and go, wretch, 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 wretch. And so often that wretch, 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 wretch adds up to guilt, 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 guilt. But the amazing grace part of it is that somebody stepped in and restored the joy of my salvation. How is that? Somebody stepped in and paid the penalty for what I did, a price that I could not pay. He stepped in and he paid for it and set me free as a result. Let me illustrate it this way. Somebody calls you on the phone today. You answer and they say, good news, I just paid off your mortgage. Yeah, woo, right? It's exciting, right? Or maybe you don't have a mortgage. Maybe somebody calls and says, good news, I just paid off your car. Yeah, that's good too, right? Good news, I just paid it all off. Well, you celebrate. This is amazing. You verify. You go online, look at your account, zero it out. <laughs> it's paid off. This is unbelievable. You throw a party. This is absolutely amazing. I don't have that mortgage hanging over me anymore. How awesome is that? This debt has been forgiven. But next month, you know what you do? You sit down and you write out another check and send that payment in. And the next month, you send another payment in. The next month, you send another payment in. And what are you doing? Are you kidding me? Why do you keep, why do you keep making payments? Why do you keep making payments on something that's already been paid? And that's what I'm saying. Why, are you, why do you keep making payments on the sin that has already been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and has set you free? Quit making payments. And there's the joy of your salvation. There's the joy. But do you see how that guilt... And the evil one loves to come in and bring up the past. The evil one loves to come in and speak. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? Oh, you'll never be able to pay that off. It's already been paid. And that's the joy of your salvation. But oh, how so many of us walk around day in and day out, our mind occupied with the guilt of my past. Even when it's already been paid for. Thoughts that will steal away my joy and peace? Number one, the guilt for my past. Number two, the fears for today. Fears? Fears. Do you have any fears? Now, when I say fears, I want you to think a little deeper than some of the, maybe even the, the good fears that we might have in our life. What are some of the good fears? Uh, the fear of things that can harm us, right? And so you have a healthy fear there. Um, <laughs> Uh, my wife is very, very afraid of snakes. 
and so much so that we'll be in the backyard and and uh, I'll say, hey, come over here, and it's just some pine straw. She goes, I ain't walking over there. I said, there's nothing here. I'm over here. She goes, I ain't going over there. Uh-uh, I'm not th-. thinking snake, and that, that might be a healthy fear. It should have been a healthy fear for me when I was young. I, I, I got in a lot of trouble because I would go out looking for snakes, and I would catch snakes, and I'd bring these snakes home, poisonous snakes. People would be calling my parents, man, you need to do something with that kid. You need to do something with that kid. That kid's messed up. I didn't have a fear at that time of snakes, and over time, I developed a healthy fear of snakes, right? Like, wow, that could, that could do some damage. That could really hurt. So I'm not really talking so much about those kind of fears, but I want to talk to you this morning about some emotional fears, some emotional fears. Uh, and so when I say, uh, what are your fears? Maybe some of you would say, well, I have uh, a fear of rejection, which a lot of us do, right? A fear of rejection, and we can remember those times where we felt a little bit rejected. We didn't feel a part of a certain group of people, and so we have this fear, and we never want to put ourselves out there too much. Maybe somebody will reject me, or maybe it's the fear of failure, and I really don't want to try something because if I try it, then there's a possibility I might not succeed at it, and so I have this fear of failure. And maybe there's the fear of somebody leaving me, the fear of abandonment, or maybe it's the fear of public speaking. That's my fear. It is, really. <laughs> the fear of public speaking. I don't want to, man, what if I mess up? What if I, and, and, and that fear grips us. That fear holds us, you see. And we go on and on and on with these different fears. But I want you to, I want you to do something with the fear that maybe popped in your mind just now, okay? Because that emotional fear, if you follow it back, I mean, just kind of follow it down the stem and maybe into the roots, Okay? And what you're going to find at the root of so many of these fears that we have in our life, maybe it's the fear of rejection, the fear of what other people think. You know that fear, right? Uh, Whatever it is, the fear of failure, fear of abandonment. Follow it down, follow it down. And what so many, what we're going to find at the root of so many of these fears is an issue of worth, the issue of value. You see, we, we follow it all down and we get to that root, which all, it all seems to go back to this place of if I fail, I'll feel like I don't have any value. If somebody leaves me, I feel like I don't have any worth. If I mess up, then I feel like I don't have any value. If, if somebody abandons me, I feel like I don't have any worth. And we all keep getting back to that same deep root. And it's that same deep root that's able to occupy our mind with fears and keep us so tangled in chasing and pursuing and trying to find that value and trying to find that worth because of that deep, deep, deep root fear. Isaiah 41.10 says something really pretty amazing. This is God talking to you. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For... I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Here's something interesting in Scripture. Anytime you you see in Scripture refer to his victorious or his strong right arm, his strong right hand, It's referring to the one who sits at the right hand of the throne of God, Jesus Christ himself. And what he's saying right here is, I am with you. Through Christ, I hold on to you. Through Christ, I won't abandon you. It's through Jesus Christ that you find your value and your worth in me. I want you to do something. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And I want you to picture sitting right in front of you is Jesus looking right at you. Just sitting right there in front of you. Now as you do that, I want you to hear him say this to you. My child, you have no idea how much I love you. 
you have no idea how valuable of great worth you are to me. I'm proud of you. And I love you so much. I'll die for you. That's how special you are to me. Look up at me. Some of you have been dying to hear those words your whole life. And it's occupied your mind, your thoughts. It comes out in the form of fear. But when you know, when you realize, when you see the incredible value and worth that you have in him, you can rest. Rest in the worth, the value that only he can give. He says, fear not. There's no need to fear. Because he's with you. He loves you. He adores you. My guilt, my fears, the third one I want you to write down are my worries, my worries for tomorrow. How many of you are like me and you worry? No, just me? Okay, no. A few few more of them? Yeah. Come on, be honest. How many of you have some worries? Do you have worries? Yeah. Yeah, we all have worries, don't we? And what what is worrying? Well, it's, for me, it's playing the what-if game. The what-if game kind of, well, this happens, and if this happens, then maybe this would happen, and maybe if that happens, then this will happen. I really don't want this to happen. And what what happens? Our minds go continually in a million different directions, playing out scenarios that most of them will never, ever happen or take place. And we feel like some sort of control when we're able to worry about this and worry about that, as if we're preparing. And, And so that's why we worry. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 6, 34, he says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow is going to bring its own worries. I kind of I picture him laughing as he says that, you know, kind of like, don't worry about tomorrow. There's going to be a lot tomorrow to worry about. You don't have to worry about those things tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. You know what worry is? Worry is really just imagining the future without God in it. Worry is imagining the future without God in it. And that's not living by faith. It's not trusting him. I don't know about you, but, but I can have some things to worry about, and if those things subside, I don't worry about those anymore, then my mind automatically goes and looks for things to worry about. And if that's not enough, I turn on the TV and they give me a whole lot more stuff to worry about. I was watching uh, NBC News the other morning. And uh, as we're watching it, it was a special report edition, whatever it is that they did, an investigative journalist or something like that. And, uh, and it's, it's in big, bold letters, uh, Bridges in America. And I'm like, what, what, what's going on with bridges in America? And it was just recently that a, uh, a bridge, I think it was Italy, uh, collapsed. And so as a result, they did this big investigative report. And they're reporting on this is stuff that you need to know. And he's standing there in front of this bridge. And he goes, we got exclusive access underneath this bridge. And they go underneath the bridge. And he says, look right here. There's some rust right here. And what you don't know is a bridge at any time in America could fall. And he's telling me all this, and I'm going, man, I didn't know I should be worrying about that, but now I do. (laughs) I get in my truck, and I head to work, and just before I get to the bridge, I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I better watch out. Any bridge you come to now, you got to worry about it, right? Because something could happen. Yes, something could happen. But what is it? Imagining the future without God. And we just read, don't fear, don't fear. Don't I'm with you. But that, those are the big three. 
Those are the big three, okay? And so I understand. Here, basically, uh, we find Paul, and he addresses these things. Don't worry about anything. Uh, and, and he's saying all this. There's the guilt. There's the worry. There's the fear. And it, it's, it's one thing to say, all right, don't worry. Don't be guilty. Don't fear. But Paul doesn't stop there. Do you see right here instead, he goes, it's not just about not doing this, but instead it's about doing this. And Paul outlines, and I want to show it to you now, how to take control of those destructive thoughts in our minds, okay? So here's it. I'm going to give them to you. There's three of them, and we'll get out of here. Uh, they're very, I, I put it this way because I want you to remember. Some of you can remember back years ago when they did this whole campaign. It was, it was the Stop, Look, and Listen campaign. How many of you remember that? Yeah, and so evidently people were not stopped looking and listening before going across railroad tracks, right? And so they did this campaign, and so they say, well, you come to a railroad track, what do you do? You stop, and you look, and you listen. Why? If you don't, you get run over by a train, right? And, and so that's the big, so, so, but I wanted to give it to you so you'd be able to remember it at any moment. So when that guilt starts coming back, when, when that worry starts creeping back in, when those fears start to consume your mind, you can go, wait a second now, what did Paul say? Let's stop, look, and listen. What are the keys to this? And so here they are. Number one, stop. What does it mean to stop? Write this down. Take time to be alone with God. Take time to be alone with God. Now, that's tough because we are busy people. We are hurried people. We are people that we continually occupy our minds with different things. We're people. How many of you are like me and you're just an impatient person? Impatient? Yeah, come on. Fess up. Fess up. Yeah, we're impatient. I'm, I'm an impatient person. I, I get frustrated when, when I get. I got, I got put in Chick-fil-A timeout twice this week. I did, man. You know what I mean? It's like you go and you, you do your order, and then you pull up and you pay, and, uh, and then you pull up to the window where they're supposed to have your food, and they hand you your drink, and then they say, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to pull up there. Um, your food's not quite ready, and we'll bring it out to you. And, and when they do that, I try to keep a smile on my face, but I'm like, oh, man, are you kidding me? Oh, and you do. You pull up and, and you feel like you're in timeout. You feel like you're being punished. Like, I should have ordered better than that. I should have <laughs> not ordered what I ordered. And so you sit there, and I don't know about you, I'm just like, I get anxious, man. It might be only five minutes, but this is building up inside of me, and I don't want to have to wait. It's that impatience. It's that impatience. It's that always going and always having to go, always being busy, but never, ever taking the time to stop, to be still. It says here in Scripture, Psalms 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. What does stillness look like for you? Stillness looks a little different for me, maybe, than it does for you. When, some people, when, when, when God wants you to be still, maybe for you, it's having that closet at your house where you go into and there's no distractions, but you know you have to just take that time to be alone with him. Maybe for you it's in, in the car, and you can turn off the radio, uh, and, and you can just be, be in that, that, uh, the car by yourself and talking with God. Maybe that's it, being still there. For me, it's walks. Um, I do a lot of walking. Uh, my neighbors will tell you they see me every single morning out walking my dog. Um, uh, I walk around just around the backyard. My wife, she'll tell you, I'll just get out in the backyard. I'll just walk and walk and walk in circles, you know. Um, here at the office uh, or at the church, uh, a lot of the people who work here throughout the week see me just out walking the parking lot. I'll go walk in parks. For me, it's walking, but please understand, when I'm out there walking, those are moments where, where I'm able to get quiet from everything else, and I'm able to simply take everything to him. And that's what it is. Paul says pray. Pray about everything. That's what it means to be still, simply taking everything to him. I think it's so interesting how for so many of us, prayer is not our first choice, but it's our last resort. Do you know what I mean? Because we're fix-it people. 
And so we'll have, remember, problem number one and problem number two and problem number three, and they pop up. And so what do we do? We start to try to deal with problem number one and fix problem number two and handle problem number three. And we go at it with everything that we can, and that keeps us so busy chasing down, trying to fix all these problems. And finally, when we get to the point where we realize, I can't fix it, we say something like, well, I guess the only thing we can do now is pray. Last resort. And what we don't realize is that we have been given this amazing privilege by God to take everything to him in prayer. Not only that, he wants us to come to him with that. How many of you remember when you were a, a little, and, and maybe it was your brother or sister, and uh, you were young, or maybe it was uh, somebody that, that was, uh, you were playing with at the time, and they wronged you. They did something that you didn't like. And so your response to them really quickly was, I'm going to tell. Remember that? Remember that? I'm going to tell on you. I'm going to go tell dad. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go tell dad. And what that was was you appealing to a higher authority who could actually handle the problem that you were facing. And in a weird sort of way, I want to challenge you to do the same thing even now with everything that you face in this life. It's going back to that point where you realize that you are a child of the almighty God. And no matter what happens in your life, you can scream out, I'm going to tell dad. I'm going to tell dad because I've been given that privilege as his child. And he welcomes me into the presence, his presence, with no matter what it is in my life. And so we begin here. We begin by stopping and taking time to be alone with God. And the second thing I want you to write down, number two, is to look. We stop and then we look. What does it mean to look? Write this down. Thank God for all that he has done. To be in a constant state of thanking God for all that he has done in our lives. Psalms 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Uh, several years ago when I was just meditating on, on this scripture right here, uh, it was as if a, a light bulb went off in my head, and I, I saw it, I read it in a completely different way than I had read or, or seen it before. Before, I would read this and go, enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. And, I, and I, it was translated in my mind that when you go in to talk and pray to God, that you should begin by, by thanking him and praising him. And yeah, that's very much probably what it means, uh, at least partly. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think what it's saying is that through thanksgiving and through praise, those gates open wide. Through thanksgiving and praise, you find yourself in the presence of God. It's through thanksgiving and praise that you actually have God's ear. You have his attention. And you enter his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And that transforms your mind when you do that. You see that when my mind is filled with thanksgiving, I don't have my mind filled with these other things that have been occupying my mind. Thanksgiving. I have a, uh, I've been diagnosed with, uh, years ago now, diagnosed with uh, glaucoma. And uh, if you don't know what glaucoma is, they kind of explained it to me this way, that uh, uh, you're going to have to keep taking these drops the rest of your life or else pressure builds up in your eyes. And if it builds up too much over time, all your peripheral vision starts to go first. And gradually, it's as if suddenly you get this tunnel vision to the point that suddenly you can't see anymore. But it's a slow process over time where you just lose your eyesight. That's what glaucoma is. Uh, the only reason I'm telling you that is because I think we, as Christians often, often get what is called spiritual glaucoma. Do you know what I mean by that? At one moment in time, we're seeing and we're thanking God for all of these blessings that he has poured out on us in our life. But as time goes by, we quit seeing those very things by which he's blessed us. It starts to gradually fade away. It changes. We don't see it for what it is anymore. And this has devastating effects on our life. It has devastating effects uh, in, in a marriage. Think about this for a moment. And by the way, let me just tell you guys this, okay? I'm kind of proud of this. But uh, I, with Kim, with my wife, I get a lot of points for this, okay? Um, I, and I tell her this every once in a while, I can remember 
exactly what she was wearing the first time I ever saw her. Ding, 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 ding. Lots of points, right? Lots of points. Ding, 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 ding. I can remember exactly what she was wearing the first time I ever laid my eyes on, on her. But, but, but you know what? I have no idea what she was wearing last Monday. <laughs> I don't. I... What's happened? Well, over time, we quit seeing, don't we? We quit noticing. I don't know, uh, Kim does this, this every once in a while. I don't know if all you ladies do this, but I, um, I think sometimes she tests me a little bit, you know? And what I mean by that is um, she'll, she'll get something new done to her hair, and she'll come home, and uh, we'll be in the kitchen, and she wants to, know, to see if I notice, right? And so she's standing in the kitchen, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, is something wrong with your head? What, what? No. <laughs> No, but everyone, everyone, oh, did you get something done with your hair? Yeah. And notice and see, see, see. But, but so often what happens is we quit seeing those very things that we are thankful for. We quit seeing them. We quit spotting them. And we go through life and we're so focused on all of our problems that we quit seeing all the blessings that he has put in our life along the way. But as we thank God, as we take time to thank him, then he directs our mind, he directs our eyes, he directs our thoughts and says, you know what, you can thank me for this, thank me for this, thank me for this. And we begin to see all of these amazing blessings in our life. And guess what, as we see these blessings in our life, those problems begin to fade. Thank God, thank God for all that he has done. Years ago, um, it was many years ago, because... Uh, my kids were, were pretty small at the time. I can't remember exactly how old. Uh, I've told you guys this um, before, but uh, uh, Kim was having a Bible study on Wednesday nights for women at our house. And, uh, and so she gave me instructions. The instructions were, get the kids and get out of the house, okay? And so, all right, take the kids, get out of the house. And so I, as Ben you know, wanted to be a fun dad, I tried to come up with different things that, that we could do fun, you know, on those Wednesday nights as she was having the Bible study, thinking of creative places we could go. And, and one night I thought, you know what, I'm going to take them to Zesto. They'd never been to Zesto's before. And I took them to Zesto's on, on uh, 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 Ponce de Leon Boulevard, downtown Atlanta. And I remember we walked into Zesto's, and we go up to the counter, and we order all this, this yummy junk food, you know. And, and uh, we go, and we sit down, and we're sitting there at the booth, and we're eating. And as we're enjoying our food, I happen to look over in this kind of side door in the back over here. I, I see a guy, kind of suspicious looking, um, kind of creeping in. And what I mean by that, he kind of, he kind of opened the door and looked like this. And, uh, and just kind of slowly came inside. I thought, well, this is kind of weird. What's going and I began to realize that maybe he had been asked not to come into that restaurant before, but he was coming in anyway. He was coming in, and he came over to me as I'm sitting there eating with, with my kids, and, and he kind of comes up to me and goes, hey, 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 man, um, will you buy me a cheeseburger? And I realized that yeah, he, he's probably hungry and wanting a little something to eat, and, and I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a cheeseburger. I reached in my pocket to get some money, and he goes, no, 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 um, you don't understand. Uh, you're going to have to go order it for me, okay? And I, I realized that he had probably been asked not to panhandle there and zest those again and, and, uh, and had been asked to leave and not come back. And so I said, yeah, 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 man, no problem. I'll, I'll go order your cheeseburger. And so I walked up there to the counter, and I'm looking at the board. I can't remember the name of it. Somebody actually reminded me of it last uh, sermon. But I looked and I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. And I ordered not a single, not a double. I ordered a triple. One of those big old cheeseburgers, you know. And I ordered this giant cheeseburger and I got him a drink. And, uh, and the lady gave me a ticket. And so I walked back over to him and sat down with my kids and said, listen, uh, here's the ticket. All you got to do is just walk up there when they call your number and, and get the food. He said, all right, all right, all right. And so I sat there, we continued eating, and then they called his number. And so, so I look over, just kind of watching what's going on, and I watch him go up to the counter, and uh, he grabs the bag, and I watch him as he looks down in the bag, 
And then he rolls the bag up like this and grabs his drink and starts to walk out. But as he's walking out, he comes, he comes right up near our table, and he looks at me, and I'm thinking, here we go. He's going he's gonna to tell me what an amazing guy I am right here uh, and, and thank me for this. But instead, he looked at me with this scowl on his face, and he said a couple of expletives, and then he said, you didn't even get me fries with that, <laughs> and walked on out. Now, when he said that, I looked at my kids, and my kids are both like. <laughs> and I think at that time, I was like. <laughs> but, but then, man, I got so mad. I, I, I started, how dare he? How dare he? How dare he say you didn't even get me fries with that? I went and I bought him the biggest burger I could find, and, 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 and he said, <laughs> And as I'm sitting there seething in Zestos, it was almost as if I heard God say, what you so mad about? I mean, really, what you so mad about? How many times have you done the same thing to me? I've given you this and this and this and this, and all you can do is keep looking at me going, didn't even get me fries with that. I think God's been convicting me about my complaining. You know what I mean? How easy it is to go through life complaining about problem number one, problem number two, problem number three. Complaining about this, complaining about that. Somebody stops you. How's it going? Oh, man. You don't know, believe what's going on. Let me tell you. And I complain and complain and complain. And it's as if God, God kind of showed me that complaining is the opposite of thanksgiving. And so often I'm too busy complaining that I'm not thinking. So often my mind is filled up with all that's wrong that I'm not focused on what's right. And he told me that complaining is basically being the opposite of thanksgiving and praising him. That would be slandering him. You see, when I complain, what I am in essence saying is that God is not great. God is not good. God is not in control. If praising is saying, God, you are great. God, you are good. God, you are in complete control. God, I do trust you. Complaining is just the opposite of that. And so in essence to the world, I'm complaining and I'm saying, God is not great. God is not good. God is not somebody who can be trusted. And I slander his name. I think so often sometimes that the only thing we really want from God is garbage pickup. You know what I mean by that? It's once a week we have the garbage truck come to our house. Once a week we, we get all our garbage and we go take it down to the, 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 the curb. And the garbage man comes and picks it up, carries it off, and we got another week to go. And I think sometimes all that we really want from God is to be that garbage pickup God. God, come take all the junk out of my life. Come fix everything. I'll see you next week. never thanking him and praising for all the ways that he's poured out this blessing in our life. I don't know about you. He's just been convicting me about that lately. But look, look, look and thank God for all these things that he has done. And then number three, we stop and then we look. When we look and we thank God, we fill our minds with thanksgiving and we don't have room for complaining. And then number three is to listen. Listen. What is listening? It's filling your mind with his truth. Filling your mind with his truth. Eastern meditation suggests that you empty your mind. Biblical meditation says to fill your mind. It's very, very different. Filling your mind is putting the word of God, putting his truth 
inside of us what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things, he says, that are excellent and worthy of praise. One second. I'm sorry. good. Did you see what I did there? Did you? Did you see what I did there? I reduced. You see, I was kind of out of juice. So I, I reduced. See what I did there? Some of you, some of you. You walked in without joy, all out of joy. Paul said, rejoice, rejoice. How do you rejoice? How do you rejoice? When you got problem one, problem two, problem three, when you got these problems, how do you rejoice? You got to (laughs) reduce. You you, you see, you see, there are some of us, there are some of us, who are worn out. Our life is falling apart. We're going crazy in our minds, and it never once has occurred to us. Six months. I talked about last Sunday that there are Christians who are spiritually dehydrated, and you are exhausted, and you're worn out. You're ready to completely give up. You have no hope. Don't you know that you reduce in the Lord? That you fill your mind with what is good and true and right, all that you find in him. Have you friends who will speak the truth in your life? Do you study God's word? Do you find time to listen to a message, a sermon? Do you spend time walking alone with him? Do you take time to reduce in the Lord? It's there that you find your joy in the Lord. Oh, if you're tired, if you're stressed, if you're worn out, Reduce. Reduce in the Lord. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Friend, if you don't know Jesus, please, most important decision you'll ever make, call out to him. Talk to him. Pray a prayer, something like this. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. Save me. Come into my life and forgive me of my sins and be my God and my Savior, my friend, forever and ever. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, you meant it with your heart. The Bible says you can know you're a child of God. Nothing can ever separate you from his love. Most important decision you'll ever make. Father, I thank you for those who just prayed that prayer. And I thank you that they now belong to you. You belong to them. Help each one of us to realize that, to know that, to walk in that each and every day. To fill our minds with what is good and true and right. All that comes from you. And it's in that that we find joy. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.